Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks so much. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kimmler. Our next guests are the director and star behind the very tense, very good new thriller, Hunter Killer. In it, Gerard Butler plays a submarine crew captain on a rescue, leading a rescue mission that may also be a trap leading to World War III. Let's take a look. Everybody from Hunter Killer, oh. Gerard Butler, and director Donovan Marsh. Hey, guys. Yeah. Hey. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on this movie. It was, it was, it's a wonderful film. It's incredibly tense, thrilling. I had a ball watching it. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Uh, you know, there have been a few submarine movies in the, in the past, right? You've got Hunt for Red Ox. No, there's never been one. Never, ever first. heard or seen another submarine movie. Well, I'm wondering life. if you go back and you watch those and you try to find ways to define yourself and make things new, or if you try to leave them out of your mind so that you're, you don't feel uh, encumbered by, by what they've done. Can you talk about that, Donovan? Yeah, well, it was a great tradition of submarine movies, uh, and I obviously went back and had a look at all of them, and you know, some of them bear up today, some don't, uh, but Das Boot for me is the definitive submarine film that stands up. It's as tense. Uh, it puts you on the edge of your seat. And I really wanted to try and capture something that Das Boot had done, but in a modern context, on the latest, greatest Virginia-class nuclear submarine. You say the latest, greatest Virginia-class nuclear submarine. You guys worked extensively with, with the Navy, right, in research and also while shooting that. Gerard, can you talk about that, what kind of research you did and how you worked with them? Well, the Navy were amazing to us. They gave us um, a lot of their best engineers so that we could completely replicate the, the sets, the control room. Um, they gave us their commanders, and Donovan and I went out on a hunter-killer sub for three days underway from Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. where we went through all the, the parts of the movie and the different drills that we do, the battles stations, uh, fire drills, and we picked up so many ideas while we, were, while we were down there. And then when the commanders were on set, they literally felt like they were on set in London, that they were actually in the control room of a nuclear fast attack submarine. And then you get to spend, I had this script for years, so I had a lot of time to spend in the mind of Joe Glass. About eight and years, right? You had this Eight years. We got oh. it back in 2011, and it was always a great script, and a submarine movie hadn't been made for a long time. Um, but, it, but there wasn't the situation between the US and Russia. There wasn't that tension. Um, so you didn't have that same emotional connection to the drama. Uh, and then things changed, and then... We that, that's when we're like, okay, Wait, let's you, get this movie going. Marlis. You read the script, like, this is great, but we got to get more tension geopolitically. Exactly, I had to make a couple of calls. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Putin, can you do us a favor, say some weird stuff? Can you uh, ratchet up the <laughs> geopolitical tension here, Mr. President? I have, Thank like, you. Exactly, I've, I've done it in all my movies, you know, from, from Olympus Has Fallen with the Koreans. Right when that came out, there was everything was going off there, and then London Has Fallen, and... It seems to, that drama seems to, I don't know whether you say you get lucky, because that's not really the way to look at it, but you kind of get lucky. Now, when you're, uh, <laughs> when you're working with these guys uh, from the Navy, and you know they know exactly how everything works, but you guys also have to tell a thrilling story, which means, you know, in all stories, even when based on true stories, you have to take liberties, because you have to have dramatic action scaled for a 90-minute, 110, 120-minute movie. But I, from what I've read in your interviews, you really wanted to keep it as realistic as possible for so these guys could watch it and feel like it all sort of made sense for them. Was that difficult for you guys to do at the end of the day? It was as long as, you know, we're, you, you, like you, you define it brilliant. You, you need the drama and you need the tension. And sometimes that comes from within the same comrades in the same sub. So there had to be some tension. Uh, the idea of this is a captain who's never worked with his crew. They haven't established that ethical kind of integrity together. And that's part of where the drama c comes from. So in that respect, you're always pushing the Navy to say, well, you know, we have to make our story. But uh, they were actually surprisingly supportive as long as we didn't get to ridiculous crimson tide levels, you know, where I'm sitting with my chihuahua on board and, uh, and, and smoking a cigar and spinning my baseball hat. Oh, man, I got to recheck out <laughs> crimson tide. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of all the, the background, and, and you tell a story where the drama, you push it as far as you can go, but the background, everything that is happening, the protocols, the, the, the commands, the, the actual surface, you know, everything you're dealing with is incredibly real and authentic to not just to keep them happy, to be to keep us happy, because that truth and veracity really helps an audience get involved and feel like they are down there with the submariners and they are really involved in this story. But it also means that when we screen it to the Navy, as we did, they love it and they're incredibly moved and excited by it. So that's been one of the best experiences is sitting with that. We, we screened it to 1,300 submariners the other day at Groton Naval Base and they were, I don't think I've ever experienced an atmosphere like that. 
Now, you know, you're no beginner when it comes to action movies and thrillers. And I think oftentimes when it is an action movie and a thriller, so much of the tension in the action comes from physical action that's on screen. And so much of the tension and action in this movie really comes from the ideas of what's happening and you actually having to really flex as an actor a lot of the time and sort of discuss what's happening and kind of make believe this tension. It doesn't come from fist fights or shootouts or anything like that. Did you recognize that going into this? And were you excited about the chance to... To do something like that? Yeah, very much from the, from the second I read the script. I, I, I knew that there would be an option for me to play Beeman, head of the Navy SEALs, or Commander Joe Glass. And I loved, for me, that, that uh, opportunity to be more contained in my performance and, 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 and come from a place of a, of a quieter authority. You know? and, and that's what this movie is. It's a simmering violence. It's, and, and Donovan shot it and directed it so brilliantly that you, you, you climb in to the dilemmas and the minds of, of these different warriors warriors in their different realms. Um, but it's about logic, it's about intellect, it's about intuition faced with these incredibly pressured dilemmas from one moment to another where you've got to make these gut-wrenching decisions, but it's all <clears throat> pulled in. And do that allows the drama to play out so much more. Yeah. Do you think about your preparation for, do you prepare for the movie differently when you're doing a performance like this versus doing a performance like London Has Fallen? Or are you still looking for the dramatic beats to hit no matter what? You're always looking for the dramatic beats and then you're almost trying to um, immerse yourself in the character so that essentially it comes from truth. But here it was a much more subtle truth, you know, because we're working within, as you say, it's not the action. You don't get a chance to jump about, shoot guns. So it's coming from... There a are guns point. shot in this movie, though. Not, People are... Yes, there's lots of action. Um, you, you know, but it's they're much more intense, defined parameters between the different characters and the viewpoints of where we're going to go, what is happening, who are we fighting against, what decisions do we have to make and who thinks what on either side. So it's all this very tense and suspenseful. But like you say, that's another important thing, which one of the reasons that it went past what I felt other submarine movies um, offer is that it isn't just I, I, the classic subgenre where you're contained down there, you know, sun deprived, you know, nerve frayed, um, little little room, um, a thousand feet underwater. But it's also the clashing of the military minds in Washington and and this clandestine team of special ops going into um, you know behind enemy lines. So it's like three different thrillers in in the one kind of portrait of a of a of a of two nations moving towards war in some. Part well, you've got the tense story. decisions being made by the Pentagon, and you've got this incredible setup with Gary Oldman, Linda Cardellini, and uh, Common, and then you've got what's going on in the sub with you, and then, like you said, you've got the uh, special ops team, the SEALs, out actually trying to stage a, a rescue mission. Yeah. These three different worlds that are also in sometimes juxtaposed to each other and are making decisions kind of against each other because what they see in their area is different from what the other parts are seeing. Can you talk about staging that and figuring that out? Yeah, it's a real challenge when you have multiple storylines, um, but it's also an opportunity to take each storyline and use it to make the next storyline that much more tense. Uh, and I personally like different points of view in a film. You're not just getting that one point of view of in the sub. You're getting what that would be like to play out in Washington if you were in a war room. And each one of those scenarios is, 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 is incredibly interesting. And so I was, I was really excited about blending those three things together. Uh, because if you can do it right, you actually up the thrill, you up the mystery, you up the tension, and I really think we did that. How often did you find that when you got into the editing uh, room that up that putting these storylines against each other worked as well in the editing room as they did in the script? Because oftentimes a writer's vision for things sort of bumping up against each other can be vastly different from what happens when you get into the editing room and you have to juggle things around a bit more. Yeah, it's hugely challenging. Uh, uh, you don't want to drop the ball or lose the tension. So it just took a lot of edits. Uh, uh, I get very close to it when I'm editing, so I'm not always sure exactly, is this thing working? Um, so we bring in the producers. I have to come in and remind yeah. them, <laughs> let it go, let it go. we got to cut that out. So I was like, oh. um, or put it back in. Yeah, yeah, as oh, it's a certain as case. Case. <laughs> um, and then we play it for test audiences uh, and see how they react. And we take that very seriously. And then we go back and recut. We even reshot a couple of things. And then finally, you arrive at something that, that gets everyone out of their seats. What yeah. was the toughest uh, storyline to shoot? Oh, they're all tough. Um, you know, inside the sub is difficult because it's literally, it's no bigger than this stage that you're on uh, and half the movie is happening in this space. And you've got to find novel ways of filming it so that it's still visually exciting and, uh, and doing can, something interesting. Can you move walls in it? Is it kind of like a You can move the walls and we built it up on a gimbal so that I could tilt the set through 30 degrees oh, so, so cool. I could get, I don't want people pretending like they're leaning, but to actually the old Star be Trek, leaning. you know? <laughs> 
um, we didn't have to do that. But it felt authentic because you do actually want to close the set off because it makes the actors feel like they're really down there. And so often we just closed it right down, had a very wide lens, the cameraman's in there, I'm in there, 10 crew people are in there, and the entire uh, cast of people. And we're tilting the set 330 degrees. It's, it's very dramatic and it adds, it makes everyone feel like they're really there. Yeah, there was really a, a, a claustrophobic feel in there, especially when you're working 12 hours a day and you're, and, and you're playing these scenarios. So you're always in the mindset of being under an incredible amount of physical and psychological pressure. And, and even though, yeah, Donovan had to be very creative in, in, in finding new ways to express that. But at the same time, you get this flow. It becomes almost like a play in there. Um, when everybody starts to know who they are and what their orders mean and what they do from the pilots to sonar. So when you start a scene that's incredibly tense, it's perhaps we make a discovery through into the action part of it and the whole ship starts moving and everybody together and, and you're kind of running around and through to the end. Like sometimes there'll be seven, ten minute sequences which you rarely get to do in movies and at the end you're like mm -hmm. holy shit that was awesome i really we were all in it looking at each other going you know yeah. i just you could really feel it yeah i've never really had feel like that shooting before i've never felt it uh, while you're filming often filming can be quite a cold process but doing it on the set that looked exactly like a real submarine Talking it up and down. And amazing. probably having so many limited options in terms of how you could shoot it, which so. makes the, sh the shoot move a little bit faster and keeps everybody on their toes a bit more, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It almost felt like exactly what he said, like a stage play. You run long sequences, and that way you get a, a reality or a realism uh, and a grittiness that you wouldn't otherwise get. You know, it was already thrilling while we were doing it. You, you, the, the people that were around on set were were always commenting and they felt that they were in the real thing, as did we. And then, you know, once you get a chance to get into the editing room mm -hmm. and, and start pull, you know, punching into those close-ups and getting those interesting shots and, 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 and getting that energy moving through these scenes and then cutting outside the sub and cutting to, you know, the, the, the various other um, aspects that, you, 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 that you're climbing into, you knew if this is already this exciting, by the time we put it all together, it's going to be grabbing onto your seat, which is exactly what it is. You're a producer on the film, Gerard. You've been a producer for a number of years now, right? Maybe going back to 2009, 2010? Yeah, law-abiding citizen. How are, you, how are you choosing your projects? How does that work for you? You know, I, I don't know if I have any hard and fast rules. It's kind of a, a, a project that I like, that I find interesting, a character that I think I can do something with, maybe a story I've, I've never told because I, you know, from the, from the franchise that has fallen, you know, to this, but I also do smaller movies and, you know, from Family Man to um, Keepers that's coming out next year, is it's just where I want to go at that particular point. Or, or sometimes, like when I made 300, it's, I'd already made a decision, no more sand on, um, you know, uh, sword and sandal epics for me and then I read the 300 script and went how could I not do this so so that's one of the exciting things about this um, about the careers you never quite know where it's where it's going to take you you know or, or, you have or, a little more control over where it takes you well, now. that's why I love or love producing because you get to I, I actually sometimes think I prefer developing scripts to performing in them I, I, I like seeing this come to fruition from the script I first got in 2011 to making it a much more plausible, relevant uh, script of today that you could try and pull off. And the challenge of trying to pull off a submarine genre, which had been out of vogue for a while, you know, and, and just put your own, uh, and being able to choose the directors, choose yeah. the cast. And, how did and that work? How did you find Donovan? And how did you know that he was going to be the right guy for the job, which he obviously was? Very much so, he, he was. So um, I'd interviewed many directors. For over a two-year period, I, I met with many different directors. And you always knew, if we're going to make this this movie and, and reinvigorate the submarine genre, we're going to have to take it somewhere special. Like, what what can we bring that's new and fresh? And Do I'd, I was sent Donovan's movie, um, this little South African thriller called I Number Number that he wrote and directed. And I don't know why, but I just thought I wasn't going to like it. And I remember <laughs> in my gym putting it on going, okay, what is this? And it's like, yeah, interesting trailer. But it's, uh, no, I don't, no, no, oh, that's cool. Oh, oh. Oh, and the next man that I'm saying to my trainer, go home. I'm watching this movie, and and I loved it. It was, you know, just his 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 pacing and his characterization and the way he covered things. It was really sucked you into it and and immersed you in that world, which is what we were going to have to do here, like that that Daz Boat 
idea, you know, where you just pull an audience into that life and that environment. Um, and then we met and we had a great meeting. I never forget. He's like, I was waiting for him to say, no, it's like win the part. I've, I've had to do it many times. Win the part. What are you going to tell me? And the first thing he says is, what do you think about this movie? And when he go, shut up. I'm supposed to ask you that. But I like that he was sitting you know, with his height and, and it was just like, you know, I'm, I mean, it was no ego, just <laughs> chat, just um, let's, you know, let's debate. Right. And it became a debate. And then after that, I tell you, and, and this is two or three of my biggest moments in my career was when I took a further step, things that I wouldn't normally do, where I had to maybe call the head of a studio or call a director when I'd normally just wait, but I actually called and said, you have to know how much I believe in this movie. I did it for 300. I called the head of Warner Brothers and, and ended up playing that role. And that's what Donovan did. After the meeting, he wrote me a letter and he said, I don't, I just want to say, I, I don't know if you got from that meeting how much I care about this project and what I think I could do with it. And I read that and I was like, okay, that's, that's our guy for sure. What made you care about this project so much from the script? What made you know that you could do something specific that nobody else could do with it? I, I like to think I was able to bring a certain sensibility to it. I, I'm a South African director. We don't have the kind of budgets in South Africa to make action movies at the level the Americans do. Uh, and so I have a certain style that I approach uh, action with. Uh, and it's about anticipation. It's about setting up what doesn't happen. So when something does happen, it hits you with so much more force. And I felt reading the script that really suited my style of directing. There were these amazingly tense scenes within a submarine. Uh, and at large sections of the film, it's all about anticipation. It's about getting you closer and closer to the edge of your seat. And then the big explosion or then the big action takes place. And I really felt that my style suited that. Plus, I thought it was the first action script I'd read in 10 years where I couldn't predict the ending, where I literally didn't know what was going to happen. And, and I think that's what's happening. So, so many action films these days come the third act. You kind of know how it's all going to play out. And in this film, you just don't. It's, it's a great mystery. Uh, and, and that really appealed to me. Uh, and then it was geopolitically relevant with the Russia and America. And it had something to say about that, which I won't give away. Um, and so all those elements, I thought it could be tremendously original. In regards to it being geopolitically relevant, I have to say, as a uh, bleeding heart lib over here, there was a bit of a wish fulfillment for me with a, a character in the movie. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? I don't know how to talk about it without giving it away, other than I think it has something interesting to say about going to war um, and that attitude. Um, and it harks back to... Well, I'm not going to actually give it... I'm not, I don't want to say... He's trying to get us in trouble here. He's, I'm going to be <laughs> careful what I say. It, it was I'm big. turning away going, Donovan, you take that one. Uh, you, got, you had the chance to um, speak about the film and working with the Navy at the Pentagon, or at the Pentagon right? In, in the briefing room. What was that like for you? Surprising. Um, I, um, I went along to the Pentagon. The Navy invited me, and I was meeting four-star admirals and the head of the Navy and, 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 just, and getting the tour around the Pentagon, which was a fascinating experience and, and, and a sign that the Navy were very behind the movie. We could see, I could see from spending my time with them how, how into it they were and how proud of it they were. Um, and then they also said, just and we'd love you to do a little press conference. And the press conference to me was about the partnership with the, with the Navy and you know letting sure the public knew why the Navy wanted to partner with movies and the purpose for them of letting people, giving them insight into the, the world and life of, 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 um, of submariners. Um, I didn't quite realize what I was stepping into, though. So when we get into the back room and I see, you know, all the, the there's like a hundred odd chairs, and I, th I thought this was just a small press conference, and I said, no, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty busy, and he said, just go and say some things about the movie and your experiences, and I walk out, and suddenly Barbara Starr is there from CNN, and um, and then I look behind me and I see the Pentagon, and I'm like. This is really from the briefing room in the Pentagon. And I knew they haven't done any briefings from the Pentagon in a, in a long time. So I was slightly surprised that they were starting it with, with Jerry Butler. Well, I think, it took, <laughs> I think it took a lot of people a few minutes to get what was going on. And at first, it looked like a very surreal image that like, could potentially just be, maybe you were head of a cabinet now, for all we know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, see, and I didn't really get, as far as I knew, I was just doing a press conference for the Navy. I did actually see the irony of that afterwards. Like, when, everybody was like, oh, okay, it's for a movie. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm talking, I, I opened it because they said, just talk about your experiences. So I talked about my time on the Bond movie where I basically had four lines 
um, and I was a, a sailor on, on a ship. Two of my lines were taken off of me, one which said torpedo bearing range 6,000, um, and I think the mix must have dropped it. And I've been traumatized since, since the, um, the British naval supervisor said, you wouldn't say that, he would say that. Uh, that's what I opened my statement with, not quite realizing it. <laughs> This is the Pentagon behind me. And people are like, what is he talking about? Um, so I think it was maybe just, and, and then Barbara Starr immediately jumps into Saudi Arabia. And I thought, four questions straight about Saudi Arabia. And I was, I was like, okay, I think I, I think I got to be on right now. And you actually gave the best answer about Saudi Arabia than anybody in the administration actually had given. Can you talk about that? You, were, you had decided to not go to Saudi Arabia after the death of, uh, of, Kash of Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist, right? Mm -hmm. No, it was just it was only a, a simple answer from our from from our experience was we were already on tour doing promotion for this movie and 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 sad to say we were very excited to 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 go to Saudi Arabia because a lot of good people put in a lot of work for our movie um uh, in good faith and um and then the press broke the day the, the morning of the night we were supposed to leave but I think we we had a discussion and 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 knew that we were going to have to upset some people, but it would be upsetting many more people if we were to go ahead, including ourselves. It just felt completely wrong to be associated with anything over there at this point. So I'm pretty sure we made the... the I know we made the, the right decision on that, but... Yeah, I think you, I think you did too. Um, you know, back to the movie, uh, before we get to audience questions, I just want to compliment you a little bit, Donovan, because you had said the way that he covers stuff and that you were talking about his film prior to this. And I think that is really important in this and especially in regards to contemporary action movies where it feels like the camera could be anywhere and there's seven cameras on the set or in the room and they're just cut, 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 cutting. And it feels like in this, there's a fair amount of kind of classical coverage where it felt like you were actually very concerned about camera placement and how it was going to move and how it was going to be motivated. Can you talk about taking your time to actually do that on the set where it feels like oftentimes action movies rarely take the time to do that? Yeah, I love a scene that's carefully choreographed where you as the audience member can put yourself in that scene. It's not cut so quickly that you just wait for it to be over almost, you know, it's just bang, bang, action, action, where you can feel the geography between the different characters or just the place that you're in. I think if you can understand that, you can actually get invested into the drama so much more when you know it's, they're this far from that or that the sub is coming towards the, the mine, underwater mine, and you can feel the geography and the distance. And the camera just sometimes has to sit so that you can appreciate that. And that there was such great tension in what the crew and what Jerry was doing naturally. I thought, let me just capture that and let that do the work. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's just sort of, um, it, you know, I always imagine something like mathematics or arithmetic, and they were always rules that we didn't know until we discovered them, but they were always there. And that's what it felt like in this movie, when, and that's why I say we discovered a flow, because it was like the moves and the positions and, and where we ended up was just there waiting to be discovered. And the second you stepped into it, and there, 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 it just felt this effortless move and flow of this teamwork between uh, everybody, all the warriors and the sub, that you kind of went, yeah, that's it. There people, it is right there. People talk about that often, which is every now and then you step onto the set of a movie and you feel kind of protected by, you suddenly feel protected by what they refer to as like the movie gods, which is like, oh, this one's working out. Things seem to be going pretty well. And you have an idea that like maybe in the end it's going to come out better than you could have you could have hoped for. Is that sort of what you're talking about? Um, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it, it is. It is. But funny, I don't know if that's my negative Scottish brain, but the second you said that, I, I thought, yeah, and every time you think that, the movie flops. Yeah, yeah. And every time that's, you think the movie's a disaster, it turns out, I remember making Law Abiding Citizen and thinking, this is going to be awful when it was our first producing job and there was so much infighting and trying to fix things and then suddenly we watch the movie and you go this is awesome yeah. i'd never have i'd never have known but i mean a flow in terms of performance and an effortlessness between um but yeah you're probably right because if it's the flow in that then then it feels like it's heading towards a great story and a great performance and something very exciting but it was as much as I move to a certain place and my exo steps behind me and the pilot moves into his position and you kind of go, yeah, that's, that's exactly how it was supposed to be now. Mm. And then it's just, it's just putting it on camera, you know? Yeah. Let's get some questions from our audience. What do we uh, got here? Right here, hi. Hi, I saw the film Friday in Scotland and I'm just gonna to touch upon what you've been saying. 
Did you fly here for this interview? Thank you so I much said, for I coming. Said. That's so nice of you. She Thank flies you. everywhere for my interviews, by the way. She's amazing. I want to say, you know, I've been at a submarine before. I worked in Reside Naval Base at the start of my career, and you really did accurately portray what it's like in a submarine, because I don't think many films do get that, how the close proximity and it, like their sleeping quarters and everything. And I've just got to say, well done, because from cinematography, when your character just goes down in the submarine, was just superb, and it got yeah. you right from the beginning. I mean, one of the tricks in this film is we shot on a real submarine. So we had the USS Texas out at sea. So I went at the helicopter and filmed this $2 billion uh, prop out at sea, uh, doing its maneuvers, but also interior. And we then built sets that fitted exactly with the interiors of a real submarine and a real crew. So I've got real crews doing real drills intercut with my actors in such a way as you can't tell the difference. And I think that adds Super. to the, the realism. Yep. So when you were out in a helicopter shooting a $2 billion prop, did you sort of lose that feeling of like, I'm a South African director without the money to make these big American <laughs> action movies? Like, okay, yeah, I'm a big American director now. <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, in South Africa, we can only do one take of every stunt. And, and it's kind of the same when you're with a $2 billion submarine. I wanted to do this thing called an emergency blow where the submarine shoots out the water and actually blasts right up and, and, and out. And, and, they, and the Navy said, right, we'll give you one take of that. Um, and you're in the helicopter, you don't know, it's, you've got the whole ocean in front of you. You don't know where the submarine's going to come up. They radio a coordinate to you. And they say, we're going to be out of this coordinate in five seconds. And we'll be within 100 meters of that coordinate. And so you're just framing up and you wait. And luckily, the, the submarine popped just in the corner of frame. Yeah. I quickly if, got it in. Yeah. If you look closely, you'll see it didn't quite know when it was going to come up. But that's also what makes it so exciting when you watch it. Yeah. You're so in it. Yeah there and then oh there it is okay <laughs> uh, next question uh hi my my question is to drag nice to meet you uh nice how to were meet you, you how were you as a kid growing up what was your how were you as a kid growing up what was your um dream job and if you had a chance what would you say to young yourself um, i thought you first of all said what were you uh, something about a cute girl now a cute girl i'm like me a cute girl. um <laughs> But what was the first thing you said? What were you, what were you something? As a kid growing oh, up. Oh, as a kid growing up, yeah. not a cute girl now. Okay. <laughs> it's a, because I don't really know how I am as a cute girl now. But as a kid growing up, um, what was I like? Oh, God, I, I think I was a little pain in the arse. But um, I, I, I always was um, playing and, and, and whether it was in my mind or whether it was with my, my friends, I always loved to live in these kind of fantasies, you know, and tell stories or imagine that I was in stories when I was younger. I always wanted to be an actor, but I also, you know, had the typical things of imagining myself out in space or being a fighter pilot or something. So um, probably because I wasn't talented enough to do that. And I thought, well, I'll just make movies where I get to pretend to, to, to be those things. And then if I had a message to my younger self, it would probably be, you know, it's, you know, just to, to chill and enjoy the ride because it's all going to go the way it's going to go anyway. And, and it, it, pretty much every bit of stress that I induce upon myself just lives in here. I'm only as, I'm only as stressed out as I am stressed out. You know, the fact is it's all going to be fine. And you might as well just, you know, you're going in that direction anyway. You might as well enjoy it. Not to say don't work hard. Work hard, give your best, but enjoy the ride because it quickly start to realize how short it is. <laughs> That's depressing. <laughs> Next question. Gerald Butler, I appreciate you, sir, very much. Um, what would be your advice for a 22-year-old in order to become the true great gentleman that you are? In order to become the, the true, true great, great gentleman. gentleman. That's it. You know, I, I, I may have to give an answer that's, that's, um, that's not very popular because a lot of where I, what I had to go through to be a true great gentleman was not being a great gentleman. It was being a rogue. It was getting into trouble. It was failing myself um, and, and, and learning the rules of, of what it means to have integrity, what it means to be a man of your word, the power that stands within, you, you know, a simple promise, a simple guarantee, you know, and, and, and not letting yourself down, not letting others down. But but I, I would love to say that I always knew that. I, I spent many years doing different things, letting myself down and letting others down. And um, and and it's a beautiful ride when you realize that essentially that's what's important in life is how you conduct yourself and the mark you leave on other people by by just by example, you know. 
But that takes a lot of trust and faith in the world that we live in because it's really, and I'm not saying I do it all the time, um, but it's, it's very challenging because we're often pressed and pressured to not be gentlemen. I think I've never... Nice oh, sorry, George. No, that was I it. think I've never one more. Somebody have a question for Donovan? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear from you, Jim. No, 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 no. Donovan, Donovan, Donovan. Right here? Uh. Yeah. Hi, Jared. Um, I'm coming from Paris, so I'm really excited to be here. And I have a pretty uh, general question, but in what kind of movie do you prefer acting in? Where are you from? Paris. Paris? Yeah. Oh, Paris, Paris. <laughs> um, uh, oh, I fell in love with a girl from Paris when I started law school and <laughs> broke my heart. Oh, my God. Anyway, oh. Paris. <laughs> with the lives we live. Um, I, 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 that's a very good question because when I work in a small movie and a, and a more uh, intricate character and something that perhaps you can, you can and say more with in a, in a, in a richer way... Um, I love those movies, and I love that they're harder to make. There's less budget. It's more guerrilla filmmaking, and 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 it's it's often a lot more special to your heart. But it's so much fun making a big kick-ass action <laughs> thriller because when they fail, you get slapped around a lot. But when they work, they affect a lot more people. A lot more people get to see them, and um, and and often they're they're about heroism. They're about you know. Uh, being a gentleman, they're, but they're about the challenges, the things I talk, the challenges I've been through in my life, the, the challenges that we go through in a more intimate scale or in a bigger scale, and, and, and knowing that you're exciting people across the world, thrilling them, taking them on an adventure, because that's what happened to me when I was a kid. I would go on these adventures and go, I want to do that. I want to be in that world, and I want to make people feel how they made me feel. You know, so you, you, a movie like this, taking people on that, that ride and having them come out the other end saying, I want to be something amazing. I want to be a hero. I want to be brave. I want to, you know, I, like have courage and be and be willing to sacrifice myself for something higher. If if people get that out of it, then and you're entertaining them, you can't beat that. And we get to have a lot of fun along the way. Was there a part of this movie for you because the section that you shoot is so or that you are in is so contained that it felt like you were shooting kind of a a small indie drama at uh, times, and uh. because the other parts of the film are the ones with a lot more of the sort of slam bang action and shootouts, uh, did it ever feel like that for you? For, for it feel like did it feel like it was a bit more of a, like a, a kind of a small drama because you're just sort of on this one small set and you're moving pretty quickly and kind of like a play. Yeah, it, it did a little bit. So, like, there's you quickly have to dive into the world that you're in. And I remember when I made 300, was quickly realizing none of those sets, none of this world that people are going to see am I seeing, right. right? So I have to live in that imagination and trust and pull it all back. And it was the same in this set, having to trust that we're only in this little room, but the drama is so much bigger than that. But you can't do anything then, experience the feelings that you're experiencing, making the decisions, even if they're huge pressure, they still all just happen in this, you know, this kind of, uh, sack of meat and bones, you know, in this brain that you you can only do what you do, and um, and that allowed it to feel. So I actually loved the containment of the performance, and that you didn't have to worry about going. When, when I stepped on, I thought I already know where I am. I know what I'm in. I know the situation, and so we're already starting up here, and we just go from there. It was always about trying to get I can it. And just say Jerry has an uncanny ability to use his mind to imagine him into a situation. I would just look on that monitor, and I sometimes get mesmerized, and even believe that maybe he was really there. He just has this ability to put himself there, and not everyone has that. It's a real trick of the imagination, and what makes a, a really great actor is they can lose themselves and then they're there and it doesn't matter it's not small it's not big it's just reality and they live it and it's truthful it's honest and I think the audience feel that yeah absolutely I did when I saw the film it opens this Friday it's called Hunter Killer congratulations guys it's fantastic everybody go see it in the theater Gerard Butler and thank Donovan Barr let's you. hear it thank you guys